We had a good morning in Draper Valley, PH family. Glad to have you with us here this morning on Facebook Live. Thanks to all our guests who, who join us on Facebook. Man, we're excited to be in here today because the good news is we'll have you guys back in here next Sunday. God has opened the door that we can be at 50% capacity. And our church will, the capacity for our church is about 400. So 200 of us can be here next week. And we're, we're excited about that. But today we're going to lift God up in worship again on Facebook Live. Uh, just be advised we do that every service, even before we, we started this uh, during the, the virus. We, we were always going on Facebook Live. The only difference will be uh, it will be on Brother Randall Johnson's. Facebook page starting next week. Randall is the one that takes care of uh, video in our services, so he'll take care of that. It will be on his page. I'll notify all of you. Happy Mother's Day, all the moms out there. And, uh, we just we just thank God for all our mothers and all the godly mothers. So we're going to go ahead and, and get started today. We have we have Brother Charlie Shoup and John Aker with us again, and Sister Joyce over here, and Brother Gary and this is going to be an exciting day, so we want you just to just to worship, get your Bibles out, and, and just let God speak to your heart today through the music and through the Word. God bless you. Let's, let's worship God together here. I'm going to open with a prayer. Father, we thank you today. Thank you that you've allowed us to come into your house again in order to worship you and to lift your name here in your sanctuary. Thank you for these ministers who, who come and give of their all and they're here today to lift up that word in song. So I pray now, God, everything that we do here would glorify you. Bless those who are watching today. Be with those out there on, on Facebook and those in, in the internet world, God, who, who may pull this thing up on YouTube or, or maybe they'll see it by way of Citizens Cable or whatever how they see it. We just pray, God, that you touch their hearts and be with them and bless them. Thank you for all our mothers, Lord, and we give you the glory and praise for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we say you saints, and that's why we do it. Amen and amen. Brother Charlie and Brother John.
Seems like I'm all phones, but I'll get it out here later <laughs> in. Thank you. 
wonderful song that was. Give God praise out there. He said, well, how you going to know? Punch your little hearts on that thing, I tell you. Just let everybody know that you're so thankful that God has blessed you in such a wonderful way. And he has all of us. He's blessed all of us. We all know that. So I am so thankful to, to have an opportunity just to, just to minister for him along with these others who minister as well. We're all in the same together. And I don't mean the virus. I mean in the kingdom of God. And he uses all of us that we might, uh, we might worship worship him as, as a group and, and then that we might lead others to him. All right, get, get your Bibles. Get your Bibles. I know you have them, have them close by with you there. To turn to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. And turn to chapter 4. Chapter 4 of the book of Philippians. Uh, this is very familiar in scripture to all you Bible readers, so it's probably not going to be any any new scripture that you haven't seen. But we're going to talk about we're going to talk about worry. We're going to talk about restless minds. And I, I think during during all this pandemic and everything that has been going on, there has just been so so many emotions that that I have went through in in. You know, and, and putting up with this thing because I've never, I've never been in anything like this. I, I've never been in a situation where I was ordered to stay away from other people. You know, I, I'm a people person, and, and it's hard for me not to be with people. And you can imagine uh, being in a house with me as as my lovely wife Brenda, whom I wish Happy Mother's Day to. And our daughter Hannah, who's been <laughs> who's been secluded up with us, she's been working from home. She's a school teacher, and she's been teaching from home. But they both had to be in the house with me. You know, when a preacher ain't got nobody to preach to, <laughs> them and them cats, you know, they kind of they kind of get get the whole get the whole thing once in a while. Philippians chapter four, and we're going to look at verses six through nine. When you get an opportunity. This whole letter, this whole letter is only four chapters long, and it's good for you to go back and, and to read this letter that Paul wrote to that church, but I just want to pull out this, this section and talk about, talk about what I call restless minds. Let's look at, let's look at verse 6. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul felt that he had to put these words down. He said, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, he's talking to, to, to Christians. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So we're going to talk about restless minds and how to deal with them. Pray with me and pray for me. Father, we thank you again today. We just can't thank you enough for your blessings upon us. Lord, I can say with, with all conviction today, if, if I never received one more blessing in my life, I have received more than I can count. But the blessing that, that's most important to us is the salvation that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. Things will be changing in worship starting next week, and we'll be coming back together into the assembly. Your people will once again lift your name in your sanctuaries. And Father, I know that through all this, you have been with us, you have kept us, and Father, you have provided a way that we have been able to reach many people whom we may have never, never reached. Otherwise, so right now, as I as I look into this this message here that you have for me today, I pray that as you share it with me, perhaps I can share it with others, that they too will 
will know how to deal with her restless minds as I have dealt with mine. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise. We'll give you the glory for every bit of it. May your word do that which it always says it will do. In your name, Jesus, I say it. All of you out there will say we love you, Lord. I know that you do. And we thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Lord. All right, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, this, is, this is a good letter. This is a good letter altogether because when this letter was written, Paul was in prison. And it was written sometime about, roughly about three to four years after Christ, or, or I'm sorry, about 20 years after Christ had, had ascended and went back. And he wrote this letter to this church for, for a couple of reasons. You know, most of all his letters had to do with false teaching and trying, trying to keep people on track of staying in, in the groove, if you want to call it that, of the resurrected Lord Jesus. But we, we, have a, we have a little peculiar situation that he writes about in this letter for two things. Number one, he thanked them for a great offering that they, had, that they had given him to help him. But number two, he was also thanking them for the guy that they sent, sent to him to not only take the offering, but who ministered to him while he was there. His name was Epaphroditus. And if you read that, you will find out that Paul brags on Epaphroditus because he said he risked his life for the gospel. And <clears throat> while he was there taking care of Paul, he got sick and almost died. But, but God healed him. And now Paul sent him back to the Philippian church with this letter and wanted them to know how much he appreciated what they did for him through Epaphroditus. But now one thing that he understood that when Epaphroditus came to visit him is the fact that there were issues within that church. And if you want to put it this way, Paul was kind of worried about some of the things that, that was going on there. So he penned this letter not only as a way of thanking them, but he puts a few exhortations in here too to kind of keep them on track so that they don't get off center on their faith in Christ. Well, let, let's talk about what he says here in regards to being worried or, or being anxious. One time, there, there's a story about this fellow that was sitting on a park bench. And he had his head in his hands, and, and he was just so distraught. He was just so down. And this other fellow got off of a city bus right there on the street, and he saw this guy sitting there on the bench. So naturally, he just kind of walked over to him, and, and he said to the guy, he said, Sir, is there something perhaps that that maybe I can help you with. And the fellow looked up at him and he said, I am worried, I'm worried, I'm worried, worried, worried. I'm just so worried. And, and the fellow said, well, well, what are you worried about? What is it that's got you so worried? And he said, well, that's just it. That's what the problem is. He said, I'm worried that I forgot something that I should have been worried about. And, and I know that that kind of sounds, you know, that kind of sounds ridiculous, but, you know, there, there are people who, who look for things to worry about. They can't help it. it it's just part of their nature. And, and it, it's a fact that, that when they worry, it's because they care. They care about things. And sometimes they, they can't help but, but worry that, that some, are like, some are like this guy. If they have nothing else to worry about, they'll, they'll worry about something they forgot that they should have worried about. But now worry has always been around. It's always been with us. Solomon wrote this in Proverbs chapter 12 and 25. Proverbs. He said, anxiety is in the heart of man, and it causes depression. But a good word makes it glad. A good word. Think about that just a minute. Not necessarily a, a medication. Although I thank God for the medications that the doctors have that they can give us to help us through anxiety and depression and things, and, and they're real, and God ordains that, or we wouldn't have medicine if he didn't ordain it. So I, I thank God that there are, there are things that, that we can take sometimes when we get off balance. But, but the proverb here says that a good word is what makes, makes us glad. And a good word, of course, is, is only the word of God I mean, I, I, can, I can do my best to, to, try to, to try to give you a good word, but if I really want to give you a good word, I need to give you the word out of this book right here because this is the word that will, that will cut deep in, into the soul, not just in, into your ears. Medical studies have proven, and we know that, 
that worry and anxiety can lead to physical illness. And we, we know that. But we also know that there are reasons that we worry. We know that there are reasons we worry. Now, let me set the record here. Pentecostal preachers don't worry. We get concerned about things, is what we do. We, we get real concerned about things, but we, we wouldn't necessarily say that we worry or whatever word we want to use for it. But anyway, it's always, it's always been with us. As long as humans have had minds, uh, we've always used our minds to find something to worry about. It, it just happens. Old Job said, old brother Job, he said in Job chapter 3, verse 25, For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. Oh, man. When I, when I read that as a reference, you know, earlier this week, I, I meditated on that verse a little bit. I got to thinking about Job. And I thought when he said, what I've read it, it's happened to me. That, that tells me right there that Job dreaded losing his family. That, that Job dreaded that maybe the day would come that everything would be taken away from him. Job dreaded that perhaps his health would fail and, and he wouldn't be as healthy as he was at some particular point. You know, well, how do you get all that out of that? Because he said, the thing that I dreaded, the thing that I fear has come upon me. We know all these things happen to him. So we can see by, by this man that, that you know, worry and dread is something that happens even in the best of times and in the best of situations. So that, that's what we have to understand about it. See, worry is a side effect of the fall in the Garden of Eden. It's a side effect of that because we have no indication in the scripture that Adam and Eve had a worry in the world. It, you know, everything was, was set for them. Uh, they, they were in actual utopia. Everything was, was perfect in their lives and everything was going well and they didn't have a worry in the world until, until, and we know what that until means. We know what that happening was. You know, when, when their son Abel never came home for dinner that evening, when they gathered and Abel wasn't with them, it was at that moment that they really understood what God meant when he said, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you'll surely die. No one had died up until Abel. So they, they knew that God had said there would be death, but they hadn't really experienced it. But when their, when their son didn't come home out of the field, it was at that time that they realized what death actually was. And from that point onward, from the, from the time that they disobeyed God, from their day to David's day to the day of Christ unto our day, worry has been a part of human nature. And it will be, it will be until this corrupt mind is put on incorruptibility, as the Apostle Paul has said. And we won't be in this body, but we'll be in a glorified body. You know, Cain is the one that killed Abel, but Cain also worried. When, when he killed his brother, he was worried that somebody was going to kill him. Because when God threw him out of the garden, Cain said this to the Lord, Genesis 4, 13-14, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment's greater than I can bear. Surely you've driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. Listen, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. See, the murderer was now worried about being murdered. So that's, that's just the way it happens in human nature. Now, look, worry is, is something we do because, because that we care. And this story always, always comes to my mind at different times, different things, especially when I'm out on the water in the New River. Uh, my mom, my mom was a disciplinarian at our house. Uh, Dad, Dad was, was very low-key, and, you know, he was, he was kind of laid back, but, but we had rules we had to follow, you know, and I, I got one older brother, and, and anyway, 
when we were growing up, Mom was basically the disciplinarian because Dad would be at work and we would be at home. Well, when my brother turned 18, when he turned 18 years old, I remember that we were there in the yard and they graduated high school, him and his friend. I won't call his name, but if he's watching, he knows he knows this story. But anyway, they, they were all excited about going to the river to go swimming. Dad would always take us swimming in the afternoons when he came in from work. And we would go down the New River and we would swim, all of us guys, and then, you know, we had a big time together. But when my brother graduated high school, turned 18, him and his friend, they were going to go swimming themselves before Dad, before Dad got in from work. And Mom said, no, you're not. You're not going to go by yourself down there at that river. You're going to wait till Dad gets home and then he'll take you. And I remember distinctly, I remember it, and my brother told my mom, he said, look, I am 18 years old, I have graduated high school, I make my own decisions, and we're going swimming. And mom kept, kept trying to, to get them not to go, him and his friend, but as they, was, as they were walking up through the yard and headed towards the river, Mom, mom said this in, in her famous words in the community there in Idaho that remembers my mom. <laughs> she said, okay, big boy, you go ahead. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If you get drowned, don't you come running back to me and try to find some help. <laughs> and, and it seems that, that when I get together with the folks around town there, sometimes that, that story always finds its way, always finds its way back. And the reason is my mom definitely was going to get the last word in it. She was definitely going to have the last say. So she said, big boy, you get drowned don't come running to me. And I think about that when I get out on, on the river in a kayak. See, we worry because, because we care. We do. It's the care that we have that causes us to be concerned. Now, we're powerless in things that we can't control. Things we have no control over. We're powerless in some things. Now, the people in Jesus' day worried. They, they worried about what they would wear. They worried about what they would eat. They worried about what they would drink. But because that's what, that's what he told them not to do. And he said, don't, don't worry about these things because God will provide these things for you. But he didn't say that in the context of being a sin. It, you know, worry is not one of the big ten. It's just the fact that, that it's, a, it's an effect of sin. But when Jesus told them not to do it, it was a simple fact. He was trying to get them to understand that their worry could not do anything for them. They may worry about getting food, but that wasn't going to get food for them. They may worry about their clothes, but that wasn't going to get them any clothes. And he, and he actually said to them, you can't, it, you, know, you can't even worry yourself taller. He said, you can't add one statue you know, to, to your growth. So, so worry is, is of no use, even though he said it wasn't, you know, we shouldn't do that. But many today worry about the same things. Now, I am, I am blessed beyond measure. I don't have to worry about these things. I don't worry about food. I, I don't worry about clothes. I don't, I don't worry about shelter. I, I don't worry about the drink. You know why? Because I'm blessed with God, and I realize that. I realize how blessed I really am. But listen, I know that there are those out there who are not as blessed as I am. I know that. And I know that God watches out for them as well. And I pray that he helps them to get these things just as, as he has helped me to have them. So, you know, our worry uh, is about some of the same things, sometimes even more things. Uh, I, I've learned the more you have... <laughs> the more you fear losing sometimes. I found out that that tends to be the case, even like with old Job. Now listen, here, here's where some of our worry comes from, and this is not an exhaustive list. This is just, a, this is just some of the things I thought about, uh, and you know how I think. Our worry stems from fear of losing conveniences. It, it does. Think, think about this. Before electricity, nobody ever worried about the power going. Before anybody had electricity, they, they didn't have to worry about the power going out because they, they didn't have any power. So they, they didn't know what it was to start with. Before cars, before automobiles, uh, nobody had to worry that those would pass inspection but because there weren't any cars. So nobody had to worry about their car would, 
would, would hold up or if it would be, nope, that was a teenager. You know, before there were cars, teenagers didn't have to worry about whether or not they'd pass a driving test. Uh, a trooper friend of mine told me he stopped an 80 year old man one time for speeding and he asked to see the old man's driver's license. May have been my dad. Anyway, he got stopped for speed, but he asked him for his driver's license, and the old fellow said, I don't have a driver's license. And, and he said, he asked him, he said, why don't you? He said, I've never had a driver's license. He said, you, how long have you been driving? And the old man said, well, about all my life. And he said, and you've never had a driver's license. And he said, no. And he said, why not? He said, well, I ain't never needed one to now. You know, so that, that's, that's the truth. So before we had these conveniences, we, we didn't worry about losing them. Our worry, our worry today stems from technological advances. Yeah, they, they do. Before the Wright brothers, nobody ever worried about, about dying in a plane crash. Before anybody flew, they never worried about crashing. And, and you think, well, that, that's a bit ludicrous. No, it's true. It's true. That, that's why I said at the beginning, the more that you have and the more that you're able to do, it seems like that there's more things that can that can go wrong or, or that can happen. Before we had computers, uh, I can remember back before we had, before computers was as big as they are now and you can have them on your wrist and carry them in your hand. You know, but before we had computers, nobody worried about getting their bank account hacked into and having it drained. That, that wasn't something you had, to, you had to buy protection for to keep somebody from doing that because you know, but I remember a lot of my family put their money, you know, under their mattress. That's where they kept their stash. I, I knew where it was, but that's just how they did. Our worry, listen to this, it's important. Our worry stems from what I call information overload. Information overload. There are those who have never believed that you could actually know too much. But I've come to the conclusion that you can really know too much. Now, I'm big on education. I think it's a good thing. I really do. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad that God affords us the opportunity to be, to be educated and to learn things. And it's a good thing to do that because he, he's provided a way for us. But I also remember what Jerry Fowler said one time. He, he told a lady, he said she wouldn't kill a bat. And he said, if you won't kill a rat, he said, it's obvious that you've been educated beyond your intelligence. And, and I think sometimes that, that can happen. I think we can know too much sometimes. You, you and I, you know, have an information overload. Think about this. Before the age of radio, which was first, before the age of radio, nobody ever worried about the world being invaded by Martians. Nobody ever thought the world, you know, it was in comic books. They would write that comic books were were just that, the fictional comic books. But you know, in 1938, a man by the name of Orson Welles did a radio program called War of the Worlds. And it actually upset so many people that they actually almost got the military out to combat these Martian spaceships that the, that the people believed that had actually came and, and come to the world and was causing war in some of the major cities. And the reason, the reason it was such, had such an impact on people is because when you heard it on a radio somewhere down in, in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina and you listened to that on the radio that this was happening in New York City, you don't know if it was or not. You, you, you were just going by what you heard. You had no way to, to really prove that was really happening. So, you know, there, there are things that, that have, have come about in this age of technology that has, really, that has really caused us to have restless minds when really we, we needn't have them. You know, I, I guess this is what I'm trying to say. What we did not know, <laughs> we could not worry about. I, I guess that's basically what, what I'm trying to say, you know. So now, now we worry that there's something we don't know you know, in, in this age of technology. At, at the one point, there are things we didn't know, didn't bother us because we didn't know them, but now we worry sometimes because we think there's something out there that we don't know. Listen, you, you, can't, you can't keep from worrying. 
And, and I don't care if you're a psychologist or a counselor or a psychiatrist or a pastor or a minister. I don't care who you are. If you have found a way to keep me from being concerned about my family and their welfare, you, you come and show me that. And he said, well, you got to pray and turn them over to God. I do that. I do that. But when I'm not, when I'm not right in their presence and I'm not right in their care, then sometimes that's not going to happen. I'm going to share with you a testimony here that I've shared a lot of times. And uh, it always gets to me when I share. <clears throat> but, but this is something that really taught me in my life of how to depend upon God. And when, when Hannah was born, our daughter, I had, a, uh, I had a, a brother, which was between me and my older brother, of course, that I never knew. But there were four years between he and I, and there were four years between him and my older brother, and his name was David. And David died of, of what we call crib death, or, you know, the syndrome that's today. He, he died from that, and they never really, really determined there was anything wrong with him other than that's, that's what had really happened. And, of course, I know that destroyed my parents, and... That's why I would always try to make a little light of it, and, and I would always tell my mom I was a replacement kid. You, you know, they ended up with two boys, and if David had not went on, I don't know that I would have been around, and of course I would have to fight her over that, because you can imagine how that would go. But anyway, here's, here's the point of my story, is the fact that when Hannah, you know, before Hannah was born, uh, Glenda had miscounted back in 95. And we were so excited about the news that, that she was with child, and then all of a sudden it was gone. And that was that was pretty hard to take. That was pretty devastating. But anyway, we we managed to get through that. And, and as the story goes, we went ahead and, and later became foster parents and ended up adopting two wonderful boys. And things were working out for us at that point. And then we had never given thought about another child until she became pregnant again with, with her daughter Hannah. And everything went great with Hannah. And when she was born, uh, she had a little little issue with the with her liver starting to work good, you know. And so she was in the hospital a couple of days with that. And we got that straightened out. But after we got her home, here, here's the point. After we got her home, and <clears throat> after she spent, you know, nights in the bedroom with us, of course, in her little crib, we moved her into the nursery you know, about a month or so after she was home. And man, I would go in there every night and I would kneel beside that little that little crib and I would just pray and I would say, God, you know, I need you to protect this kid. Because in the back of my mind, I didn't know if SIDS was something that could be generational if it was passed down. And I needed that we, you know, we had had miscarriage. And there was just, there was just a worry there. And, and I would pray and listen, one night, now, and I know people say that God speaks to them, and some it, it's audible, that they actually know that it's God speaking to them, and it's audible. I've never had the audible experience, but I can tell you this for a fact. I knew that it was him that night. And as I, as I prayed beside that little crib, all of a sudden, everything just kind of became still in that room, and, and it's like everything was, was out of my mind, and I could feel the presence of strong. It's like someone was standing behind me. That's how strong it was. And God simply asked this word. Right in the middle of my praying, he simply says, don't you trust me with her? That was his very words to me. Almighty God said, don't you trust me with her? Now you talk about getting my attention. That got, that got my attention. Because this is, this is probably one of my first encounters I can ever remember having that, that strong of, of connection with God. And I was stunned. I was scared. I was awestruck. I didn't know what to say because I guess that really was the question because of my prayer. And I really couldn't get anything out. I, I was just, I was there. And then he, he continued and he said, this is what he said. He said, if I choose to take her, I will take her even if she's in your arms. 
But if I choose to, to let you raise her, I will do that as well. And, and I thought, this is powerful stuff. But then, uh, here, here's the way, I, I've always said Peter was an ego, St. Peter, because Peter would always talk back to the Lord, you know. And I thought, and I said, Lord, now listen, this, this, is, what I'm, this is what I'm saying to God. You know, and I, I should have just said, amen, and thank you, Lord, hallelujah. But I didn't, I didn't. I sat there and I said, well, Lord, this is why I feel justified. I feel justified in my fear. This is why I feel justified. Because in 95, this was 1997, two years ago, 95, you gave us a child, and we were excited about that child, and all of a sudden it was gone. And, and I don't understand that. And that's why I have such a fear for this child. And, and it was just a silence. It was silence. And I thought, oh, Lord, <laughs> I've made him mad. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe you know, I've always heard, well, oh, you shouldn't question God. But I've learned that's not true. He don't mind us questioning him as long as we don't accuse him of anything. So I sat there and I waited. And then just in that nice, gentle, loving tone, which was, which was not audible, but in my mind it sounded audible. And the Lord said, if I told you why, you would not understand. It was that simple. Hey, that did it for me. That did it. I knew then that he has a plan. And I got up, and I walked out of that room, and yeah, I still pray for her even today. And I continue to pray for her even after that. But my prayers were totally different. The feeling that I have today towards our children and my wife and our family and those I love, I know who it is that's in control of that. So my mind goes back to those words. Don't you trust me with her? Yes, I do. And I trust him with all my loved ones. See, you, you can't keep from worrying. It's a natural response in the human mind which causes us to fear or be anxious about things which threatens to harm us or those that we love over which we have no control. Dan Rather, you remember Dan Rather? He used to do the evening news. You, you know, Dan Rather said the world offers us no comfort, and it doesn't, Be, because he said that the news, when he retired, and I can't find this anywhere, but I heard him say it, and he said when he retired, he said the news only entertains one half of the world with the problems that the other half is having. Now, I can't find that on Google. I don't know that he ever wrote that down or anybody kept it. I don't know where the interview was, but I heard him say that. He said that the news does nothing more than entertain one half of the world with the other half's problems. Let me tell you something. The news does much more than that today. That's what they used to do, but they do much more than that today. The news media has become a tool that many use as a platform to push their own personal agendas. And, and the, fear, the fear that's involved with that information overload is that those who have control of, of pushing such information out, they say what they want to say, and we're like the ones back in 1938 who, who listened to the War of the Worlds on the radio. You and I sometimes have no way of actually knowing what the whole truth really is, but we have come to learn that some of it is true and some of it's not. The point I'm trying to make is that this technological knowledge that we have is not always for the good. We are living, listen to me, and I'm closing, we're living in the most educated and informed generation in the history of the world. We are, you and I are living in that generation. In seconds, we can electronically retrieve a weather report from the other side of the world in seconds by way of radio waves on that little gadget that we have in our hand, those little cellular receivers. 
or maybe even now what we have on our wrist. We hold in our hands, listen, we hold in our very hands a means by which we can talk to or text someone else without regard to distance, untold distances. We have the means to order food, to buy cars, to get loans, to transfer money right in the palm of our hands. Everything can be done that quick in the palm of our hands just because that's where it is. We don't have to let this control us. Though. We don't have to let it control us because the Apostle Paul was trying to encourage a group of people that were worried about him. So he sent Ephroditus back to them following that grave illness. Paul wanted them to understand that that which they had worried about him, that God was taking care of him. And Ephroditus brought that news back. Then they were worried about Ephroditus because they knew that he was sick. And Ephroditus came back to show them that God had took care of him also. So he gave them this advice that we're looking at in our text today. And although this was written over 2,000 years ago, it still speaks to us in our world today. God knew what this century would be like. He knew that. He knew how far advanced in our thinking we would be. He also knew that human nature never changes. Because, see, we still have the residue of our first parents from the Garden of Eden. That sin is still in mind of your spiritual DNA. It's still in there. That's why it's so important that we must be born again so that we're born out of that and into the Spirit of God. It still causes the same problem for us as it has humans throughout world history, the fear and the worry of not being in control. Listen, we'll never have a cure for worry, listen, until this human mind is no longer corruptible. Once we have thrown in corruption that the Bible talks about of the glorified body, there's always going to be concern about the things over which we have no control. But, but, although there's not a cure for it, there is a treatment for it. There's a treatment for it. And that's what I want to focus on here in closing. Look at this list that the Apostle Paul gives us here that we should meditate on or that we should think about. Look at this list. He said, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer, Supplication. Supplication is offering up the things that we need with thanksgiving, thanking him for what we already have. He said if we will do that, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard, will guard our hearts and our minds. But let me throw this in right here. If Christ is not in your heart, if you haven't been born again, and he doesn't live in your heart, you don't have a guard. You don't have a guard over your heart nor your mind. You're, you're, you're going you're to have to deal with that on your own if Christ is not in here. That's why it's so important we have Christ in here, that his peace may guide us. But listen at what Paul tells us that we should focus our attention on. He says, whatever things are true, first of all, it's got to be true, all right? Secondly, whatever things are noble, those things which, which are honorable, which mean something, things that are noble, things that are just, those things which we know are right, things that are pure. There is so much impurity today in every, everywhere that we look. If you think on that, there won't be peace. Whatever things are lovely. If you want to talk about lovely, go out and look at these trees and these flowers and that beautiful sky. Those birds that, listen, there's a lot of lovely things out there other than just human creatures. There's a lot of loveliness in the world. Whatever things are a good report. Oh, man. How far, that's a whole new sermon in itself to believe those things which are a good report. You know, I find that we're more drawn to dramatic reports than we are 
good reports. We tend to, to like bad news sometimes more than we seek good news. If there's any virtue, if there's any virtue in it, and if there's anything praiseworthy, praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You, you know what fits that list? This word right here is what fits that list. The world has nothing that it, it can offer us in terms of being praiseworthy or in terms of being the whole truth and the absolute truth. But right here it is. It's right here. And what Jesus has said to us, as he said to those in that day, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. Let me, let me, let me say also, don't worry about where you're going to be this time tomorrow. Don't worry where you're going to be this time next week because I have come and I have made a way that if you will put your trust in me and that if you will ask me to come into your heart and if you will be born again, then I go to prepare a place for you. And where I am, I will come and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you might be also. So, so you don't have to worry. You, you don't have to have a worry about those things. Well, what's this world coming to? Well, I'll tell you what it's coming to. It's coming to an end. It's coming to an end. I, I've read, I've read it. I, I know what we're headed for at some point. But you know, as, as the late Dr. Billy Graham said, I have read the last part of the book, and Christians win. Christians win. That's why it's so important that we're born again. Listen, I worry at times, but it will never own me. You may worry at times, but it never has to own you. Worry, listen, worry never steals from me the joy and peace that I have in Christ, which is in my heart. Yes, I will always be concerned about things. Yes, there will always be that, that that will worry me over which perhaps I don't have control, but it will never steal my joy. It will never steal my peace because I know in whom I have placed my trust, and that is sincerely in Jesus Christ. So do you need some relief today from worry? Do you need peace of mind? Well, Right here is where it is, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. That's how you deal with a restless mind. And, and just a word, word, I guess, a warning to me. I don't let my mind wander because I'm afraid it won't come back if I do so. Pray with me. Father, we thank you today.